Hello, I'm Dr. Jers. Welcome to Shakespeare in Context. Now, when Seton Hill asked me to teach this as an online class, I'll be honest with you, I had some mixed feelings. Shakespeare wrote for a very oral culture. The sound of people's voices was super important. It was much more important than any kind of visual information. So teaching a class like this in an online context, it, you know, presents some difficulties. Now, I, I think I've, I've figured out how it would work it out, so, you know, bear with me. And, uh, but because Shakespeare's language, the spoken word, is so important, let's start with a little bit of Shakespeare's language. So, Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for stage, princes to act, and monarchs to withhold the swelling scene. All right, well, what was that? Okay, you probably figure, yeah, that's Shakespeare language. It's, uh, it's from the opening of uh, the play Henry V. And uh, if you're a native English speaker, you probably have encountered each one of these words in some context or another. Uh, now, during this lecture, uh, I'll walk a little bit through part of that famous Muse of Fire speech, and I'll also give an overview of the course. We'll talk what I mean by uh, Shakespeare in context. We'll talk about language and the nature of language and how it changes. Uh, I'll give an overview of the course of the, of the first couple assignments, and, uh, and we'll go through this um, uh, speech in a, in a little bit of detail. Um, but uh, uh, really going through that speech will be part of another lecture. Now, before I move on to general stuff about the course, I do want to go through a little bit of uh, that opening bit. Now, uh, you might be shaky on the details about, you know, which of the nine muse sisters was the muse of dance and which was the muse of history, but you might have uh, gotten, you know, you pro probably have heard the word muse in the context of somebody who inspires somebody else to do great things. And um, I'm guessing that you have possibly heard of muse in that context. But what's more important is just to understand that Shakespeare didn't refer to the muses because he wanted his character to seem stuffy and super smart and distant. Uh, Shakespeare's audience uh, knew classical mythology the way I could expect my audiences, my students, to know superheroes. I mean, you would probably know what I meant if I said, he thinks he's Batman, but he's not even Robin. Okay, that would make sense to you because you understand the context of superheroes. Those characters and their relationships with each other are just part of the, the air that you breathe in. Well, in a similar way, Shakespeare could have assumed that his audience knew who the muses were and knew that uh, classical poets traditionally began their epic poems by asking the muse to in inspire them and to help them do the story justice. Um, Shakespeare could also have counted on his audience knowing that Henry V, uh, the, the title character of the play from which the speech is from, Henry was a very popular English king who not only won an impossible war against the French, but uh, also ended up marrying the French princess and uh, united the kingdoms in marriage and ended what was called the Hundred Years' War. So, um, uh, we'll return to this a little bit later, but um, I guess just what I want to note is that if this were an in-person class, we might have an informal workshop where I would have you guys pair up with each other and read Shakespeare passages to each other, and I just walk around and I would just listen. If somebody's stumbling over a particular word or I can see on somebody's face that they're unhappy, I could just kind of stroll over there and say, hey, how's it going? And, and, and I'll help you out that way. But in an online situation, we have to make a deliberate effort to communicate to each other in any way. And so, uh, like I said, I think I figured it out, and I hope you'll bear with me, and I'll explain what I'm asking you guys to do. But we are going to have to rely on technology to do that mediation between us. Now, this is not an acting class. It's not a media production class. 
but I will frequently ask you to uh, upload brief media recordings. Sometimes I'll say you can respond either by uh, typing a hundred words out or by uploading a recording of yourself speaking for 45 seconds, and you'll often have a choice like that. Some of those media recordings will be a little bit more advanced and some will be uh, very informal, uh, just like there'll be some informal writing assignments and some that will, will require you to, you know, submit a draft and revise it and so forth. So, um, the idea is we'll be using Seton Hill technology to uh, enrich our learning environment as we immerse ourselves in this Shakespearean language. Now, during one recent online class that I taught, a student lost her voice, and another student uh, got a concussion, and as part of his therapy, he wasn't supposed to spend time watching video screens. So, um, in those situations, when somebody came to me with an accommodation request, I did the best that I could and I figured it out. And in a similar way, if you have accommodation requests that I need to hear about, we'll find some way that you can learn the course material and participate and get and get out of the course what you need to get out of it. So I, I'm not. there's another assignment that asks you to engage specifically with online learning. So I'm not going to go through a lot of detail on that right now. Uh, this course is Shakespeare in Context. And my intention is to offer uh, a foundation to help you understand Shakespeare's significance and his inspirations and, and what his work meant to his contemporaries and what it means to us today. Now, uh, rap music as a genre. Rap music fans de develop an ear for the specialized, highly stylized language of a rap song. And experienced fans, when they listen to a rap song for the first time, they know what to listen for, they know how to listen, they know when the person is doing something uh, unusually well, or when they're uh, echoing somebody else, or, or mocking them. And some details might emerge on the 10th listening, or the 50th listening, uh, but through practice, you can learn how to understand rap music, or you can learn how to understand uh, anime or manga or uh, reaction gifs, and you can learn to understand the conventions and the procedures that go into Shakespeare. Now, uh, Shakespeare didn't know a lot of what we know. Uh, he would have been totally overwhelmed by the internet. Uh, and by the the interface of a laptop or an iPad. But he wasn't stupid. Uh, people back in the day, the servants and the manual laborers and the, and, and the scholars and the, you know, church experts and the learned people, all those people would have spent their whole lives in an oral culture, listening to expert speakers and learning from them and emulating how expert speakers sound and appreciating them. It, it was a... Uh, uh, it was a social skill that they needed to survive, and they had better trained memories because they couldn't just look stuff up. It was easier for them to remember stuff than to look it up. And uh, most of them couldn't read, uh, but they had attention spans that they, that they trained. They, they had longer attention spans than we did. Uh, uh, so uh, Elizabethans had exactly the same brains that we have. They just learn to respond to the details in their environment that help them to succeed and to thrive. Um, they have the same capacity to deal with complexity. Here's a, an illustration of uh, alchemy. Uh, alchemy was a, a way of understanding the world that turned out to be nonsense. But Sir Isaac Newton, this is an illustration by Sir Isaac Newton, who spent hours, months, years of his life trying to make sense of what his senses told him uh, by putting it together through the lens of alchemy. And uh, uh, it was a branch of intellectual inquiry that, that, that kind of went nowhere, but it captured the minds of brilliant people like Sir Isaac Newton. Now, Shakespeare's plays are, are similarly ordered and complex and, and, and beautiful, uh, but uh, much of that order and complexity and beauty is in language. Now, your brain is perfectly capable of understanding everything that people back in Shakespeare's day understood. It's just that they grew up listening and uh, memorizing, and I'm not asking you to memorize in this class, but my point is they had um, a, a, a different set of mental skills that meant that 
when they heard a Shakespeare play for the first time, they probably got more out of it than you or I would get on a first hearing, just because our brains were not brought up in the environment uh, that, um, uh, that, that Elizabethans uh, were brought up in. So just as we can expect an experienced rap uh, uh, fan to get more out of hearing a rap song for the first time, uh, but if you're not a fan of rap, you have to work to understand it. Well, in a similar way, uh, uh, until you uh, really get to know Shakespeare really well, you'll have to work to get there. And I'll talk a little bit more about, about my own um, uh, experience there, but I just want to remind you, um, these Shakespeare plays, uh, uh, people paid to go see these plays. They wanted to. They were the kind of entertainment that people wanted. Uh, Shakespeare was creating art for his time, uh, and um, uh, uh, we can understand and appreciate his accomplishments uh, better when we learn more about what his time was like and what people valued at that time. So one of the things that I'll keep returning to through this course is that Shakespeare manages to give his characters so much depth. He was such a good observer of human nature that even his, that certainly his protagonists, but also his minor characters, and even his villains, have, uh, he gives them speeches in which they explain their motives and their backstories and their hopes and their dreams and their fears to a level that, you know, actors just love getting into even the minor characters and especially the villain and the flaws of the her heroes and the heroines as well. Um, they keep finding fresh ways to interpret these 400 year word, 400 year world, 400 year old word, there we go, 400 year old words that Shakespeare wrote and uh, making them relevant to new generations. So have you heard of the imposter syndrome? Well, I was thinking about that just a while ago when I couldn't say 400-year-old words. Um, the imposter syndrome is the feeling that everybody around you is better than you are, and uh, there, it, there's only a limited amount of time until they figure out that you're faking it and they're going to reject you. Um, I, now, I, I feel that way sometimes. I, I teach this Shakespeare class once every two years. So uh, what that means is uh, I'm really a part-time Shakespeare teacher. And every time I teach this class, I, I, when I look something up or I, I look things up online or I read books, I'm reminded that there are people out there who are so much better at doing Shakespeare than I will ever be. Now, um, it's not really fair to myself. I, I have other strengths, and I think this illustration shows you the other half of the story. Uh, you might not be an expert in Shakespeare, but you have expert knowledge that other people don't have. And this is a completely artificial environment where, of course, you're coming to learn, from sh learn about Shakespeare from somebody who knows more than you do. But this doesn't mean that I know more than you do about rap music or about any of the other things that are important to you and that are vital and crucial to your worldview. So, um, now 20 years ago, I was teaching an advanced editing class. And a student that I knew pretty well, the student and I, we were sparring a little bit, you know, probably something about really exciting about when to use a semicolon. And I got in some kind of a zinger on her, and people were laughing, and, and she was a little, you know, a little embarrassed. And she said, oh, shut up! And the class went silent, and her face went white, and everybody's just took a breath, and they're wondering, how is this professor going to respond to being told to shut up? And the only thing that I could think of doing was saying, no, you shut up! And everybody laughed, and we got over it. Um, now, let's also think about up-talking. You know that thing that young people do that makes old people think they sound like they're unsure? And starving for affection, and not ready for a kind of position of authority? You know, I, that's up-talking. Um, as an English professor, I'm not interested in policing how people talk. I'm more interested in observing how people talk and, and how language works. Now, I don't think the army is going to, you know, change its culture so that drill sergeants start up-talking. Okay, maggots, you want to, like, drop and do 20? Okay? You know, I mean, the army's not going to do that. Um, but at the same time, I can think of many situations where I want somebody in a position of authority to tell me what to do, but then also take a minute to say, you okay with this? We're good? All right, see? All right. Now, existing words, snack, extra, T, 
You know, in the last couple of years, I've noticed uh, Generation Z has given them new meanings. Uh, now, consider based off of, okay? Now, a base is a thing that something rests on. If you're off of the base, you're not based on it. So to me, based off of is a wordy and pointless way of saying based on. And if you mean based off of to mean it's no longer connected to the thing that it used to be based on, well, we already have spin off of. Something that, that has been spun off is already used to be based on something and is no longer based. So when in fandom, there's an important difference between based on and based off of, I just don't see it. To me, uh, based off of is an abomination. But, okay, uh, the next generation of, of students, you know, my undergraduates, don't think based off of sounds bad, and some of those undergraduates are going to be English teachers, and their students are not going to think that based off of sounds bad, and they're going to be the ones that get to make these decisions. So, um, now Generation Z wasn't satisfied with the existing words out there to describe its own sort of unique uh, social relationships. So young people coined words like bae and bruh and frenemy and friends with benefits. Uh, if you previously thought of English as a system of rules to memorize and errors to avoid, I don't know, it may be a bit strange to consider English as a, a changing and a growing thing that you observe and that you learn from, rather than something that you, that you use rules to control. So if some of you like what you're hearing now, I can imagine some of you might want to respond with a hearty yeet, okay? Uh, but no, as Hamlet would say, I, there's the rub. So let me talk about this. English speakers are creative. Uh, English is flexible. And each generation changes the language to meet its needs. And this is a good thing. It's a good, productive, and creative thing that didn't start with your generation, and it didn't start with my generation. It's a good, exciting, and living process that was already well underway by Shakespeare's day. And it's exactly this process, this good, this youth-driven process of evolution that means Shakespeare's language sounds so distant to our ears. Now, I won't always make a video like this that walks you through all the upcoming assignments, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll do it for a little bit now. Now, you've probably heard that guideline for each hour in class you should expect to spend about two hours outside preparing. Um, and if this were an in-person class, uh, just showing up, you'd get about three hours of lectures and discussions and in-class workshops. Now, that's in addition to the time that you'd spend outside of class on homework and preparing. Uh, but in an online class, all that work, I have to cover uh, just, just like it's the same amount that I have to cover whether it's an online or an in-person class, but you have to do all that work at home. You can't do it during class. Um, so that means we have to be a little bit more deliberate. So uh, in order to cover all the material that I would cover in an in-person class, I've spread out the due dates so that there's going to be work due on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, usually at noon. And you don't have to be sitting at your computer at those times. That's just the deadline for when that chunk of work is due. Now, sometimes all that's due is you just have to read another act in the Shakespeare play. Uh, an act would take about a half hour to listen to if you found an audio version. Uh, so sometimes all you have to do is listen to an act and respond to it. Uh, other times there's a writing assignment, and sometimes there's more than one assignment. And if there's more than one assignment, usually that's because I imagine, well, you have homework that you would have done before class and brought it with you to class, and then we would have done something in class with that homework. And so often when there are uh, more than one assignment due on the same day, it's because uh, 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 one of those assignments kind of represents what we would have done in class that day. So, um, so, uh, uh, you can work ahead if you like, but this is not one of those classes where you can like, you know, check out for two weeks and then catch up at the last minute and like plow through a bunch of chapters and take a bunch of um, uh, multiple choice uh, exams. Uh, there really are no multiple choice exams in this class, and there aren't really chapters in a textbook. 
we're mostly going to be reading Shakespeare's plays. That's our text. So you can work ahead uh, if you like, but uh, for the discussions, uh, an online discussion will die unless we're all reading and talking about the same things on the same day. So again, you don't have to be sitting at your computer at any particular time during the day, but there are regular deadlines. You can work ahead sometimes, but there are some things that you have to be uh, working together with the class. Any literature course depends upon discussion, and these online discussions uh, need to be synchronized. So we'll spend some time uh, talking about that. If you fall behind and there's nobody else that's, uh, that's no longer monitoring last week's discussions because they're busy with this week's discussions, it'll be very hard to engage with the discussion if, uh, if nobody is responding to your ideas. And you'll feel very l alone and you might feel less motivated to catch up. So it's a slippery slope. Stay on top of things and try to catch up if you fall behind. Okay, all the instructions for all the assignments will be available in Canvas. Just click through those assignments, click through them in the order that they're there, go through them, do the best that you can on each assignment, and, uh, and you should be fine. Uh, I've actually pushed back the due date for that first assignment. Uh, on the, 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 this image says uh, responding to this video is due 11.59 uh, p.m. Monday. It's actually due 5 p.m. Tuesday. You have a little bit more time. Uh, as I am recording this video, I haven't yet posted details to those two intro two assignments that are listed as due Wednesday, but I'll post that soon. And those are assignments that won't take much time. Again, they represent the kind of thing that we would do together during class informally. Uh, so it's not something that you would um, need to uh, do a lot of advanced prep for. Uh, now, meanwhile, uh, you can definitely start whenever you want on that exercise zero introductions assignment. And certainly you can start reading our first play, which is uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Uh, all my course policies, including the, what the textbooks are and uh, what to do if you miss a deadline and sickness policies. There's also a, um, uh, a stress release policy called the late pass policy in case you it gives you a limited number of no questions asked deadlines. All the details are in the syllabus and an upcoming assignment will actually um, uh, kind of walk you through that in a little bit more detail. So I'm not going to talk about that too much right now. Um, uh, one final thing to note is that in early November, I have a week or two of assignments that are listed as TBA, and that's because I'm hoping to get a block of discounted tickets to see some local productions. Uh, one is Romeo and Juliet, and another one is Much Ado About Nothing. And uh, if you're not taking this course from near the Pittsburgh area, you have the option of then just, you know, try to attend uh, a Shakespeare production locally wherever you are. Um, but whatever play you decide to attend, and you'll be able to pick whatever date. We don't have, we don't all have to go on the same day. Uh, that will be the text that you'll be reading in then those November slots that are listed as TBA. Again, welcome you to this class, and I hope you will enjoy it. And I look forward to uh, uh, reading your writing and hearing and seeing you uh, through the multimedia um, contributions. So uh, happy reading and uh, welcome to class.